Jesus. We are glad you are joining us to fill your heart and mind with peace and gain, gain more knowledge about how we can live more in Jesus' steps. We are looking again at the parable of the prodigal son, specifically at the younger son, the son who took his inheritance and squandered it. Now both of these sons in this parable represent real people, imperfect, selfish, and irresponsible at times. The younger son's sins are easy to see. They are not hidden in the story. He hits his lowest point when he realizes his, he has to eat pig food to survive. When I was a kid, I thought that was the most disgusting part of the parable, and it's the only thing I could really remember. To me, it wasn't the parable of the prodigal son, it was a story of the guy who ate pig food. As I got older, I learned that each character in this parable has a lot to show us. This younger brother realizes the horrible state he is in and decides to go to his father and beg for forgiveness. He thinks he doesn't deserve it. He thinks he doesn't deserve to be his father's son anymore. His father, though, reacts completely differently. He felt great joy when his son returned and welcomed him and forgave him. There was no hesitation. Pure love, pure joy from a father, God, to his eldest son, who represents, to his youngest son, who represents you and me. As God offers grace, may we sing about the same. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. this and get it on out of the way for us. I have been serving Netherland Community Presbyterian Church for seven and a half years. It has been a great time of growth for me and us. Whenever this church is doing its best, this town is served so well, and it's time for me to move on. It is time for me to move on and let you take hold of your identity as a church, your strength as a church. Um, I'm going to be here. This transition will take several weeks, and we will make sure to find a time and ways to say goodbye. Um, but for today, this is still worship. This is about God. This is about grace and giving glory to the ground of all being. We are going to pronounce a vision for well-being in this service, and we are going to embody the Spirit alive as we have tried to do this whole time together. We are called to be, as a church, the pedestal of good news. And the good news is, what was lost has been found. Peace be to all of you. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. There was a man, a father. He had two sons. The younger son 
told his father, I want my share of the estate now, before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed up all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him to the field to feed the pigs. The young man was so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. Here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father, and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against both you and heaven. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. So the younger brother returned home to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. He said to his father, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But this father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house, and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, and sandals on his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead, and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father was, has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and would, wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time you gave me even one, you didn't even give me one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed with me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. This guy who told his parents to shove off and he never really felt close to his brother. He left in a huff. He probably felt like a victim the whole time. And you can imagine when he's uh, scrounging food from the pigs, stealing it, trying to steal it from their mouths. He probably blamed his family for being in that position. Can you imagine what he felt like then? Not at all like a beloved child, not part of that family. There's a word the Bible uses a ton. Sometimes it doesn't sound quite right to our modern ears, but at some level the son was lost and probably felt like an orphan. He felt alone. He felt unlovable. Now, Gillian Welch wrote this song as a response to that feeling that a lot of us have, but some of us have it stronger. And Gillian points out that she, she's not an orphan, she was adopted, which is beautiful and difficult, and those who weren't adopted will never be able to understand. But she's trying to help us understand with a song. Uh, understand about loneliness and orphans, whoever you are, that you are loved, even when it always doesn't feel like that, which is, I think, part of the gospel, to know that we are loved even when it doesn't always feel like that.
This is the third week in a row that you've heard this story. Most of you have heard it three or 300 times before. You know the plot. You can tell it in your own words, I'm sure. And although we have stretched out other layers of meaning that Jesus may have intended with other characters, when it comes to this central character, the Son, I suspect you can tell me the moral of the story. God's love is stronger than our shame. That's the standard interpretation. It's the right interpretation. It's true. We all make mistakes, but our past does not define us. God's amazing grace for our future, for our whole life, that's what defines us. Amen? Amen. And, alongside that good news, not to paint over it, but to maybe give it some depth, to give it some shadows and relief, I want to drill down on one tiny word in the original Greek language. Barely a word. More like an interjection that might frame this whole thing a little deeper as Jesus saying even more about living our best life. I don't know, maybe when you're talking to your partner or your kids or your best friend or your worst enemy, sometimes absolutely it's the whole arc and the whole feelings of what they say that matters. Other times, when they say one word, maybe it slips out or gets repeated a bunch and it shows what they really think. Or they don't say one word, like sorry, and you know what they really think. Or they use a but instead of an and, and you know that what they just said really isn't what they believe. Or they just pause for too long for what should have been an easy yes. In those cases, can't one word express so much more than the whole speech? Now for Mark, the Gospel of Mark, that one word he uses over and over is immediately. His whole Gospel, he uses that word to start sentences so often that English translators, they don't even bother to put it in every time. Immediately Jesus goes over here, and immediately God does this, and immediately the church responds. That's why Mark is kind of like the Twitter gospel, because everything is so fast and quick. He shapes his short little narrative with 42 immediatelys, even though the rest of the Bible in total has six. For Paul, and anyone else who might have written all those short little letters after the gospels, his word is therefore. Paul isn't about pace, he's about convincing you, arguing with you. So he builds on top of another. This is the case, therefore that is the case, therefore we believe this, therefore we do this, therefore you should do this. Translators have to pick other words, since and so, and hence, but Paul uses the Greek therefore 72 times in those short little letters. So Mark is exciting, or maybe he stresses you out, Paul makes you want to think, or maybe you get your defenses up. Outside the Bible. There's this great scene, one of my favorite movies is Midnight in Paris. And when the Owen Wilson character meets the Ernest Hemingway character in an old carriage, they have this conversation and Hemingway launches in. The assignment was to take the hill. There were four of us. Five if you counted Vicente, but he lost his hand when a grenade went off and he couldn't fight as he could when I first met him. And he was young and brave and the hill was soggy from the days of rain and sloped down toward the road. And there were many German soldiers on the road and the idea was to aim to the first group and if our aim was true, we could delay them. What word showed up there eight times? And. I could barely breathe because I wanted to keep going. Hemingway is telling this story but he isn't just explaining action. He's drawing us into a feeling of being there, and this, and that, and this, and that. And we know that and connects. But in the right context, it can draw so many feelings around this whole string of ideas. It can show that these things fit together more than each of them are in their own. Think of a little kid telling a story. Mom, on the playground this happened, and then in school that happened, and when I got on the bus that happened, and there was a puppy, and I followed the puppy, and I got, that's why I'm dirty. And it's not five or six different stories, it's one story, one day, a flow of feelings they want to share with you. Or think of someone who's hiding something from you. Um, I think this happened, and uh, we did that, and yeah, it kind of sort of went like this. No, it probably didn't kind of sort of went like this. You're probably hiding something, and we can tell by that little bump in your speech that might reveal more than everything else you're trying to say. It doesn't have to be true all the time, but you see and you know, you've experienced how one little word can make a big difference. So what word shows up in Luke a whole bunch of times, and especially in the prodigal son? It's the little word, and. 
It's so common that translators, they have to start using now, and this happened, then that, he continued. But in the Greek, and, our translation that we've been using takes a little more liberty. It says, to illustrate the point further. That's really what's going on here. The prodigal son is a parable. It's a great story, great message. But it's not just a parable in isolation. It is part of this long, desperate epic, illustrating one point further and further with one more powerful illustration. Some Bibles, maybe yours at home, will actually have headings here at chapter 15. Some editor put those in. God didn't. And it might say, here is the parable of the lost sheep. Here is the parable of the lost coin. Here is the parable of the lost son. As though Jesus said it once, twice, three times, God is the God of lost things. Which is true, which is right, which I believe, which is gospel. And I think it goes further than that. Later in the book of Luke, uh, Luke is going, going on, one story after another, about money. And if you look at any one of them, it might be a story about sheep, or a story about days off, or a story about actual coins, and then there's stories about investment, and then there's farms, which is property, and then there's wives, which are possessions, and then there's actual coins again. But all of those stories, if you choose to see them this way, they all hang together as Jesus trying to tell us that love and lives are more important than money and stuff. And friends, is that something we need to remember in our world today? You can imagine other illustrations that might come up for you, illustrations around buildings and healthcare and economy and policing and you name it. That's later in Luke. Here in this middle section of Luke, I think he's doing the same thing. Emphasizing what he thinks is one of Jesus' main overarching points. Kind of several illustrations about one manifesto. That there is a way we naturally think about and react to the world, and there's a better way that we can prepare our hearts to respond gracefully. I'm going to say it again. I think when you read about 15 stories in a row on either side of Prodigal Son, this message keeps coming up. There's a common sense about how to live, and there's a holy sense that is better. So here's an example of calm better than anxiety. And here's an example of trust better than fear. And here is an example of responsibility better than selfish freedom, which is a good one to hold on to, America. And here is an example about human well-being more important than legalism. And here's an example of subtlety more important than size. Here's an example of how this message is more important than even Jesus' life. And here's another illustration of human well-being. And here's another example of grace over power. And here's an example of inclusion over prestige. And here's moral vision over relationships. That one's relevant these days. And here's love over efficiency. And here's love over grief. And here's love over shame. And here's love over greed. And, 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 and. There's always a way that we tend to live if we just float along in the current of culture. And there's a better way that God offers and calls us to. Throughout this section of Luke, this little Greek word is not, it's not uncommon at all. It happens all over the Bible 500 times. But almost every story, for about six chapters, it all hangs together with this same word starting the same message. In Greek, elegant day, tea day, parisian day, elegant day, end day, elegant day, elegant day, akousas day, sun et por antu day, I can't say that one very well, esan day, epen day, elegant day, akunon day, anthropos day, it all hangs together that Jesus has better ideas on how to live than we do. And if you push people, I don't know anyone who doesn't believe that at some level up here, but if you push people, I don't know anyone who manages here to hold on to that truth all the time. And sure, plenty of people follow Jesus here or there, but come on, I need security. I need security measured in guns or 401ks or Instagram likes or how fit I am. Or I'll fly a Jesus flag, I'll go to church, but freedom, I can do what I want and I can tell you what to do. Or I'll dedicate my life to Jesus' sense of love, except for those who don't share that sense and I'll treat them differently. Or... I believe in grace for other people. Or, I deserve joy tomorrow. Or, whatever the message we tell ourselves, whatever message we have heard from society that keeps playing in our heads on automatic shuffle, Jesus has a second opinion. So the prodigal son, it is about radical grace. It's a second opinion that 
overcomes debilitating shame. That's true whether your shame comes from sin or addiction or sex or greed or some perceived failure or how your parents treated you or anything. God's love and God's freedom for the future is stronger than anything that happened to you or anything and how you feel about what you did. That's the gospel. And God is just as interested in challenging those other hallmarks of human nature and human culture. And this is also gospel when inclusion is stronger than division. And it's just as much gospel when real reconciliation is stronger than fast-forward forgiveness. And this is just as much gospel when social well-being is more important than selfish greed. And this is just as much gospel that it matters politically rather than just being tucked away as a personal issue. And this is just as much gospel to illustrate his point further that Jesus did not only believe this, but he lived it to such a degree that most people thought he was weird, and some people thought he was dangerous, and a few people decided to create some fake news to try to justify his murder. And it is just as much gospel to illustrate his point further that he invited others to live it out. Not even inviting the best and the brightest, but regular people like you and I, who are not, I hope, ever called to the ultimate sacrifice, but we know so deeply that choosing the better path comes with conflict. And the gospel includes facing that conflict in our own souls, in relationships, in community decision making. If you figure out how to deal with that conflict better, come tell me, because that's an important aspect of wisdom beyond knowledge. All of it is hard. All of it is hard because it's important. All of it's hard because those autopilot messages are strong. But as hard as it is, we are not alone. To illustrate his point yet further, God did not leave us to struggle through this, but in all times, in all pain, in all joy, in all conflict, in all new beginnings, the Spirit of God runs to be our advocate. And for that, amen. Scotland. 
God who lives at the center of all things, who grounds all things, who brings light to all things. It's hard for us to believe that darkness is a thing of the past. The causes are varied, grief, illness, money, worries about family, trouble at work, not having work, drugs, and drink, boredom, doubt, weariness. There are the world issues of war and poverty, climate change, disease, racism, unfair trade, so on. It doesn't help when people who claim to follow God cause so much of this. But gracious God, through all the troubles, remind us to take comfort that you are with us, that you know us, that you love us. For all those things that seem right, for all those things that need new life and hope and peace and renewal, we pray. We pray that your spirit would come alongside and continue to show us a path to light and health and the peace that passes all understanding. We do not ask for a magic wand. We ask for an opportunity to live out your word. Help us to share your good news. Help us to set others free as we celebrate and embrace our calling to bring beauty and joy into the world. This we pray, Holy One, with each other, with all creation, through the words you taught. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus, that God's faithfulness is great morning by morning. Amen.